The employment outlook appears uncertain these days. PMETs, or professionals, managers, executives, and technicians, are constantly told they need to upskill to stay employable. So how are PMETs to navigate the choppy waters, and what can employers do to ensure their workers stay on course? Well, NTUC and WDA are organizing a forum to help both employers and employees. It's called Shaping Careers and Learning, and it'll be on tomorrow. That's right. Now we get a preview with two of its speakers. They're right here in studio. Gary Gunn is CEO of JobCred, and Jaya Das is Country Director of Randstad Singapore. Good to have you both here in the studios. So, when getting to the end of the year, 2017 is you know very much on the horizon. Uh, what challenges can we anticipate as far as uh, the workforce in the coming year? I think the critical question in everyone's mind is: Will 2017 go into a recessionary market, uh, or have we already bottomed out cyclically as we speak right now? I think the biggest problem that we face is not the economic condition, but more the uh, structural unemployment that we have. Uh, in Singapore, you will notice that the demand for talent is not aligned to the supply of labor. Uh, some industries such as hospitality, life sciences, healthcare, and IT, as well as functions in data analytics, big data, uh, medical manufacturing, and so on, continue to see a shortage of talent. I think in 2017, the focus needs to be uh, continued in terms of upskilling or reskilling talent to match the true labor demand. Gary, um, Jaya just talked about how we could be facing a recessionary situation next year. Um, who do you think has it tougher in such situations? Are we talking employers or employees? And how do you really find that balance? I think uh, definitely employees are the ones who are going to have a little bit of a harder time because end of the day, employers control the relationship. And the employees have to actually struggle a little, little bit to actually learn the right skills and get the right jobs going forwards. So JobCred actually uh, it uses big data technology, of course, to, to match employers to the right hires. And the idea there, of course, is, is to optimize you know, your business growth. What's the difference between an HR department and what, and what you offer using this big data tech? So what we do is we actually uh, scan a candidate's competencies and scan a candidate's experience to immediately surface the top uh, candidates. So what this does is it lets the employer find the top candidates faster and it gets them to the right hire faster. Secondly, reduce bias in the system because we don't look at name, we don't look at age, we don't look at race to a certain extent and actually that allows you to find the best uh, talent that maybe some of your HR staff might have overlooked. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about this big data that you guys use. Are we talking social networks? Are we talking, um, you know, what, what exactly do you guys zoom in on so that perhaps prospective uh, uh, applicants can, you know, clean up yeah. certain spaces that they should be cleaning up? So on our system, we actually have a consumer side as well. We actually help job seekers to identify the key skills gaps in the careers that they're interested in. So for example, we actually connect them to online courses. We actually tell them that these are the key skills that employers are looking for right now. So basically, we do two sides of the coin basically to help employers uh, to find the right candidates, but also to help candidates upskill in the right direction. So how we do the technology is basically crawling internet to build a predictive model of what makes a good data scientist, who is a good marketer, for example. Yeah. So Jaya, when it comes to the expectations then between employers and employees, how can it be avoided? I think wage increase or wage pressure seems to be the, the topmost of concern there. Um, in our daily transactions, we have seen candidates expecting typically a rise between 10 to 20 percent and even 30 percent when they move jobs for niche roles. Um, unfortunately, I'm sad to report this is a little bit on the decline. Uh, with the market softening, companies are more reluctant to offer such increases. Uh, they are forced to, to think on a more cost-conscious basis when procuring talent, as well as adhering stricter to budgets. I think it's important for candidates to then focus on what skills they're going to acquire, where they can increase their knowledge, rather than focus on whether they can fetch a better price in the market. Uh, on that same token, I think employees, when they're moving jobs, are also very interested in what job security that they can get, uh, what career progression or development. Uh, employers need to do a better job of coveting that talent if price is not the, uh, the end factor. To try and sell them a vision for where they're headed with the company as well as what strategies they have in place. Uh, this offers an alternative route to how employees are attracted to companies if salary is no longer the negotiating factor. Now, while we're on the topic of, of uh, you know, conflicting expectations, work-life balance comes up all the time, you know, yeah. employees want more work-life balance, uh, employees perhaps want a little bit more face time because yeah. we're not used to that kind of thing uh, in this part of the world. Uh, with technology these days, we've got, um, you know, cloud computing 
and all that. Yeah. That makes suddenly makes things easier. How would a company, uh, maybe drawing from experiences from your HR consultancy, how do companies sort of manage those expectations then? Mm. Singapore continues to be that competitive dynamic landscape. Uh, the expectations and productivity are never going to go backwards. Uh, having said that, work-life balance seems near impossible for the average individual these days. I think the, the later buzzword now probably is work-life integration, where one bleeds into the other or infuses into the other, if you like. Uh, technology has definitely enabled more flexibility in the workforce. I think as a result, um, employees can sort of be able to better manage the, the conflicting balance between having to be at two places at one time. Uh, but traditionally what you see companies struggle with in implementing these things is if you move away from traditional work models, you have issues that arise as a result of that, uh, culture issues in terms of how you get your people together, what are modes for communication, even issues with cybersecurity for remote working, so on and so forth. Um, I think here in Singapore we have an opportunity to perhaps learn from more mature cities. Um, so more recently, just in the week gone, uh, our Minister for State for Manpower, Mr. Teo, and a delegation went up to Germany to look at what productivity and work-life integration looks like in those cities. Uh, and we've taken a head start in instilling some of these practices here and introducing them. And I think companies can definitely leverage off that. So, so tell us a little bit more about, about, about that, what you've discovered in terms of, of whether it's possible or not to actually you know, overcome some of those challenges that you just said. Absolutely. Said. I think there are two critical factors. One is a cultural or a mindset shift in terms of what is productive work and whether you need to work in a traditional model to achieve success. The second, I think if you're not technologically set up or advanced in that area, you would struggle to implement those because much of it requires remote working environments uh, or at least arrangements where people can access work from, from different conditions. And you don't have to be chained to a desk nine to five and you can communicate with people remotely as well. So I, I think we can definitely head in that direction if we have a mindset shift to start with. Mindset shift. Uh, something <laughs> very big though. <laughs> we'll, yeah. we'll see how that goes. But Jaya and uh, Gary, thank you so much for coming in. Uh, we appreciate you being here. We've been speaking with Gary Gahn, CEO of Jobquip, and Jaya Das, Country Director from Grandstand Singapore.